The bend tang. The motor of Dremel's boat churns through the open water, leaving a trail of frothy sea behind you as you sail steadily away from the Aberdeen docks into the international waters. In the back of the boat, Q stands alone, passing the time on her comlink. You can't make out what she's saying over the roar of the drunken mistakes engines, but from the expression on her face, it's not going well. Jomo abruptly slows his boat, still a ways from anywhere, and looks nervously into the water past his hull. You soon discover why. Mines. With careful precision, the pirate steers the nimble craft around them, aided by a handful of Indonesian curses. As Jomo pilots you through the minefield, a jagged shape in the distance begins to grow larger. It's huge, a slab-like ship surrounded by smaller boats. Grinning, Jomo st uh, takes you straight th toward the enormous vessel. Hey, we got ten karma again. You step onto the converted barge with unsteady legs. The deck rocks with the rolling motion of the waves, and you hear the slap of water against the hull below your feet. The air here is permeated with the smells of the engine oil and diesel fumes, all intermixed with the sweat of sailors and the sweet aroma of roasting Aberjack. Welcome aboard the Bentang, the jewel of the Loho Joa fleet. He flashes you a brilliant smile. You'll be safe here, safer than you were in the impound yard in Hewi or at your mother's teat. Nothing enters these waters without Captain Utama's permission. Hey, if you say so. Oh, don't take my word for it, but my friend. Jomo sweeps his arm across the deck, smiling brilliantly. Look around you, see for yourself. In the distance, a cluster of enormous guns rise above the Bentang's deck. Heavy artillery coupled with a group of old model Ares CWIS systems. Millions of Nuyen worth of restricted military hardware all mounted to a creaking barge with the resale value of a mid-range sedan. The seabed beneath your feet is littered with the carcasses of countless drones and aircraft. He pumps his air arms excitedly, miming the action of a cannon firing on an airborne target. They all met their doom to the roar of the Bentang's mighty guns. Sheets of flying lead tore w wings from fuselages, rip ripped through cockpits, uh, shredded parachutes to tattered rags. And the waters that she protects are no safer than our, uh, for our enemies. Envision the seabed, far beneath your feet. She, he sweeps his arm low, towards the waves on the far horizon. New life springs from the bones of patrol craft. Coral of a thousand hues, sprouting like wheat from the bloated bodies of those fools who have dared to trespass here. Our minds make short work of those who approach by sea. An evilish crewman steps forward and claps a hand on the orc's shoulder. His voice comes out in a breathy rumble. Jomo speaks the truth, Shadowrunner. Nothing can approach this ship and live. Your guns are impressive, but that's a pretty big claim. Believe what you like, but I wouldn't question the Bentang's capabilities in front of the captain if I were you. She is, wa she is waiting for you, by the way, in your place. I would not keep her waiting long. He's got a full face and everything, so I, I imagine that he's going to be... It's probably going to be a little bit more to him than just being called Pirate. I, I'm getting, I'm getting, I, get, I figure we're going to get a name soon. What about my crew? They will wait for you in the rusted, in the rusted hulk that you call a home. The one with the corporate people towed... The one the corporate people towed in. He jerks his thumb over his shoulder. It's over there. The boat hull is here, but... She isn't seaworthy, how did you... I made some calls. Q rubs his te her temples, squinting. She looks exhausted. The bolt hole just gets everywhere, doesn't it? <laughs> Amazing how much freight you can move with a tugboat and a couple of industrial lifting airframes. It must be nice being able to call in favors from a megacorp on a whim. On a whim. It didn't happen on a whim, believe me. My relationship with the corporate is, become is beyond strained at the moment. You can talk with your friends later. Now go to Otama and be quick about it. I tell you this for your own good. You heard the man? I'll call you if we run into trouble. As you say, my friend. He taps a ch uh, cigarette out, out of the pack of his breast pocket. I shall inspect the boat hole to see if anything was damaged during transit. Jomo gives a quick nod. Q, handyman, you're with me. We have a captain to meet. Bye, everyone. Is there, it's, so it's just like out over there somewhere? Ca meet Captain Utama. Actually, it seems to be in the same direction anyway. Looks like we're going this way regardless. Is that the boat hole? They seem to have loaded themselves onto it. I guess that must be the boat hole. It's, hard, it's nice to sing it from this side. There must be a way on over there. 
Anyway. Onward. The Bentang interior. Let's get in there. It's certainly bigger than our place, that's for sure. We're making a lot of connections in a brief amount of time in this game. Hello, Captain Utama. Another, it's another troll. A weathered troll with a relaxed posture and a commanding presence dominates the cabin. Her face is serious, but her dual-covered eyes glint with curiosity as she runs them over you. It is my honor to introduce you to Captain Utama, our most gracious and benevolent host. Joma bows deeply. My captain, I thank you for your generous hospitality. I remain your humble servant and offer my deepest respect. She steps forward and places a gnarled hand on Jomo's shoulder. Straighten your damn back, Jomo. Pay your respects if you must, but I have no use for my men who bow and scrape. Jomo's back snaps straight, and he hurriedly retreats for, to, uh, to his original position. He sm his smile remains as relaxed as ever, but you can't help but notice the bead of perspiration that traces its way down his forehead. He's a fast sweater. The captain shifts her gaze over you, studying your face through the eyes, the color of dirty ice. A smile slowly creeps across her face, twisting the scar across her lips into a second grin. As for you, Shadowrunner, you are welcome aboard the Bentang. Mind my rules, and you may stay here as long as you wish. She's a lovely ship. Does the name Bentang mean anything? In my native tongue, it means fortress, an appropriate name given the arsenal at her disposal. Here. You'll be safe from the HKPF. To enter these waters uninvited is to plunge headfirst into a meat grinder, a fact that the police know all too well. Savor this moment, handyman. You're looking at the end result of me calling in the very last of my favors with the corporate. The scarred troll's smile broadens. And they paid me well, friends, very well indeed. Now, before you get settled in, there's a small matter we must discuss. I'm listening. She rests her hands on her hips. This is my ship. Your friends here, are, your friend here has paid your passage, yes. But if you prove to be disruptive presence on this vessel, I will not hesitate to have you tossed aboard, overboard. Unless you relish the idea of swimming with awakened sharks and active minds, you will mind your manners during your stay. Colorful de uh, description. You got a flair for the dramatic. True, I am not without a sense of style. Just heed my words, you hear me? You wouldn't be my first guest that I've had to put over the side. They won't make a peep, Captain Utama, I promise. This is gonna be the home for the foreseeable future, handyman. We've got nowhere else to go and I'm fresh out of strings to pull. We get Mitsuhama something that they can use, something irrefutable, or we resign ourselves to life on the open sea. Then we find them something that they can use. That's right, we do. And we start with Lamb's PDA. Meet me at my command trailer. We're gonna crack that thing. We're gonna find some answers. All right, bye, you guys. Might as well talk to. I mean, I might as well talk to the the uh, Captain Utama. The captain's wheelhouse is surprisingly warm, despite its uh, coldly utilitarian interior. Sounds of the sea breeze outside roll over the cabin, and a soft whistle hums through the cluttered room. You find Utama standing near a makeshift wet bar. Crates and tool chests loaded full of liquor bottles, all piled to a coffee table that sags under their weight. The captain swirls a clear yellow-tinted liquid around the interior of a thick glass. You watch her grab a pinch of what looks like salt from a small open dish, then carefully sprinkle it into, sprinkle it into the cup. Her voice is hard when, you, when she addresses you, but her eyes remain locked on the drink which she continues to swish around and around in ever-tightening circles. This seems to be an ongoing thing with uh, Shadowrun, Hong Kong specifically, but maybe the, their games in general, is that their way of riding somebody who's powerful and like a leader, and someone who has control over your current situation and is the only reason that you're safe right now, is always... Well, in this case, they're both, they're, they've both been female so far, but specifically, they're, 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 they bar, they're always constantly doing, taking part in some kind of refreshment or drug or thing that serves biological purposes while half paying attention to you. They're always smoking or drinking or like, you know, cradling their bottle and stuff like that. Getting acquainted with the Ben Tang, are we? 
She holds the glass up to her nose and inhales. Satisfied, she takes a, shit, a sip. Her eyes flash towards you. Good. I hate drinking alone. She motions towards the wet bar with her elbow. Water? I'll have what you're having. A bemused grin graces the captain's scarred face. Oh, are you sure? No questions asked. Lay it on me. Yutama swirls the liquid inside her glass, then tilts it your way. Have at it. Smell the drink. Her eyes, brows raise. You're cautious. Good for you. You'll outlive most of my crew with that attitude. So, what do you think? Is this... Is this fruit juice? The captain seems amused by her reaction. Her tusked smile looks almost ominous in the dimly lit cabin. Guava juice. But not that concentrated swill from the convenience store. This is real squeezed at an orchard in the Yunlong district. No chemicals, no preservatives, just fruit. She takes a slow sip of her drink with a smack of her lips. She tilts her head towards you and stares at you through dual-colored eyes. So what brings you here? Something on your mind, Shadowrunner? What's it like to be a female pirate? God is up, Scott's downs. Mainly, sa uh, many sailing men, captains and crews alike, view female sea uh, seafarers with a critical eye. We're always at a disadvantage. The glare has even landed me on me from time to time, never mind the fact that I'm the one one of the best damn sea captains ever to grace the ports of this sorry planet. I have to make a display of my power before I'm assumed to have it. On the other hand, and in the same vein, we're often underestimated. This can work to our advantage. I'll never demean myself to gain the upper hand, but I will use a man's idiocy against him to my own benefit. There's no shame in that. The captain flicks a piece of lint off her shirt. At the end of the day, I wouldn't change things. It's a good life. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I noticed a small saucer of powder over the wet bar. What's that? Itama sniffs loudly through her nose, studies you for a moment before applying. What do you think it is? I don't know. I, I saw you sprinkle it into your drink, though. Ah. She rubs a hand along the back of her neck. I spent the better part of my life on the open ocean. They say when you first start sailing, you have to earn your sea legs. Otherwise, the, ro the rolling sickness will get you. I never did that. Never had to. I had my sea legs for the, from the first time I ever sat foot on a boat. Didn't realize that it could catch up on you, though. Seems that as I get older, my stomach rolls with the waves more and more. She points towards the powder on the saucer. It's an antimedic. Antimedic? I actually don't know how to pronounce the word. It's an, it's an antimedic. Keeps me from turning green on the job. You ever find yourself in need of some? You help yourself to my stash, but don't overdo it. A little goes a long way. Never mind, gotta go. And we are done there. Well, she's a fun little character. This is one of the few games I, that I play where there's a, there's a ton of interesting characters everywhere, but actually a, a shockingly small number of them actually ever participate in your party. Because they're just, they're just out having their own lives, which is realistic, but... At some point, when, when you, <laughs> you just get used to the concept of RPGs of being like, A developed character? I guess they're gonna follow you around for the next 40 hours. <laughs> Andrei Lukanov. Racks of medical supplies and cybernetic components line the walls of this room. Across the doorway, heavy-duty instruments are crammed together to conserve as much space as possible. Many of them look, ne look uh, neglected, with a fine layer of dust and grime coating every, every raised surface. Other implements have clearly seen such regular use that they appear polished from all the handling. A man stands towards the left of the room. He wears a fitted, high-collared coat that looks like it gives him a lot of movement room and flexibility in his arms. A virtual retinal dis display hangs over his right eye, highlighting it in yellow. He greets you with a nod and a quick smile. Welcome. He studies your face. You're, ruined. You're new around here, I take it. Without waiting for an answer, he continues. My name is Andre, and I'm in the wear business. We've got a large inventory if you're interested in buying. I'm more interested in answers. You have a minute? Andre's eyes narrow. He takes a half step back, a cautious look on his face. Yes? What kind of answers? Who are you? Probably not who you think I am. I'm a Shadowrunner interested in Ben Tank's crew, that's all. 
The man visibly relaxes, his breath out- He breathes out through his mouth and finishes the gesture with a smile. Sorry about that. Those who ro roll with pirates often have a long history of their own. As a runner, I'm sure you're all too familiar with the fact. I meant no offense. Yeah, and what's your colorful history? He runs a hand behind his neck, carefully considering his next words. Slowly, he responds. It isn't a terribly exciting story. Let's just say that I've got a few creditors after my ass and leave it at that. So how'd you end up here? He appears puzzled by your interest. Do you really want to know? I got, I got nothing better to do. Alright, why not? Joho Loa appears to be sold on the value of your Shadowrunners. They ha must have information that I don't. But if they trust you, then I suppose that's all I need. He grabs you his bearded chin and his eyes sink into the floor and thought, Well, where to begin? I was a physician back in Russia. Worked in a trauma ward. It was an emotionally grueling profession. One thing led to another, and it wasn't long before I found myself hooked on BTL chips. That's where the debt comes in. A lot of debt. So much, so that there was no way I could pay it all back over in my lifetime. Given the options, I decided that a do-over was in order, so I left my old life behind. Well, I tried to, at any rate. It seems that no matter where I went, my creditors were always right on my tail. All the way up to until I fled to Indonesia. He smiles weakly. There, I met the glorious Captain Itama and her sailors. The rest is history. What'd your recruitment here end up costing you? You're a sharp one. Nothing comes free, eh? The price of my asylum here was 10 years of indentured servitude as the Bentang's onboard cyber surgeon. At the time, I thought the deal was manageable, but my continuing habit has since driven those 10 years' service up to 30. Truth is, I may die before I ever repay the captain, but let me tell you, indentured service among the Loho Joa beats the, the hell out of being a debtor back in the motherland. He looks contently around the medical bay. I've got more here than I could ever have hoped for in my old life. That was generous of them. Probably causes this crew a lot more trouble than you think. Avoiding debtors is no small task this day and age. You don't, have to you don't have to tell me. I've experienced that firsthand. I owe a lot to Tama and her people. The crew can get can be real sa uh, slave drivers at times, but at their core, they're decent people. They may owe me, but they don't work me to death. Or they may own me. Whoops. He chuckles. Well, not quickly anyway. Like you said, it could be worse. I'm glad it's not. I try to remind myself that as as, oft, as often as I can, I have a lot to be grateful for, even if it doesn't always feel like it. He snaps out of his nostalgia and stands up straight. His tone becomes businesslike again. Anyway, is there something that I can get you while you're here? Uh, med actually, yeah, medical supplies is a decent place to start. We got some money. We should get some trauma kits. Yeah, it restores a damn teammate with 100% of their health. Boom. Grab at least a couple of those. Some of those goes a long way. Got those stashed in my main character to keep him alive for a while. Alright, see ya. All these characters to meet. I'm sure there's someone over here too. Nope. Nothing seems to be interactive in this room. How about here? I think that's the last room. Yeah. That's this whole that's the whole crew area. Alright, just one cyber surgeon that's under indentured servitude to escape his debtors. Everyone's got a reason to be here. Hello? What was that name? Cooking Woman. <laughs> oh, she's got a face, though. A woman with an, in an armored trench coat hunches over a smoking grill. Her assault rifle leaned up against a nearby crate. She prods an assortment of rapidly blackening fish, eel, squid, and other sea life, all while fixing them with a critical glare. She glances up and squints as you approach. Huh. You're not a prisoner. And you don't look like a pirate. And this sure as hell ain't a starboard tourist destination. Welcome to the Bentang, whoever you are. Is the finest pirate barge in at least a 50 mile radius. Because they blew up all the other ones, right? <laughs> Name's Handyman, who are you? Chastity Blackwell is her name. Chastity Blackwell, independent mercenary. I've seen action from Azania to the Transpolar Alu Nation. But for now, 
I'm having a bit of a time with the Loho Joa. Or Joho Loa. I'm just never gonna get that one right. Nobody shoots mad me on the Bentang, and most of the visitors are potential clients. So why are you cooking all this fish? Because Utama's cooks, if you call them that, are goddamn atrocities. I've eaten prison food in Ulaanbaatar that tasted better. Word to the wise, unless you want to eat sludge that looks like it was poured from a septic tank, you're gonna have to cook your own meals out here. Trust me, it's worth it. How'd you get into cooking? Are you kidding me? Chastity smirks, folding her arms over her chest after a minute she, her smirk fades. Oh, you're serious. Okay, so basically there are three types of mercenaries. She, she lifts a hand and starts counting off her, on her fingers. The first, time are the, one, the first type are the ones who work for big outfits like MET 2000, Bright Blade, Tsunami, or whatever. They're not much different from corporate armories in a lot of ways. They've got tons of support and finances, so everywhere they go, they build bases with mess halls, barracks, and the works. Second, you've got small units that sign up with well-established clients. They don't work for a big PMC, but maybe they've got a team of 50 or so. They get contracts from a reasonably lucrative clients, a lot of work from Africa, from corporations, or the urban convoy duties in areas that are still a bit iffy. Places like Caracas, Vladivostok, Lagos, whatever. These units are, are uh, rough it a bit more, and they're usually attracted to large groups as, as, as extra muscle. Then you got people like me, true freelancers, cowboys. We fill the gaps in larger units, but we can never tell how big of a group we'll be with. Sometimes a corporation needs some soldiers garrisoned at some mine. Then they round up ten of us and throw us in the field with nothing but what we brought with us. Unless you have some kind of unhealthy love for field rations, you learn to cook whatever you got around, or you make friends with somebody who does. I was wondering where that- I was starting to wonder where that was gonna go, because we were like four pages in already, I'm like, Cooking? Cooking? She's roundabout? She had a roundabout way of getting to the cooking at first, so I, I was, uh... I thought I thought that the inside uh, dialogue was like branching incorrectly somehow. Why doesn't the Utama have a better cook? Honestly, I don't know. A good cook will make or break morale. Anybody who's ever served on the ship knows that. I can only assume that Rindali is really good at, at something else. From what I from what I hear, she uses to, he used to be a targeting officer on a Rebel Huck missile cruiser. Maybe he's the guy that set up the Bentang's defensive perimeter. I'm not sure. Still. You think a bunch of damn Filipino and Indonesian pirates would would, would stock a half decent spice cabinet? But no, it's all pre-packaged spice mix mixes, mostly scrounged from instant noodle packages. I've, I'd have killed for some Sambo Olek back a month ago, after Rondali tried to make some bebek goreng using fast food chili packets. They finally let me go ashore for supplies. Why hang out on a boat rather than a safe house? I like boats. I like sailors. She shrugs. I spent a lot of time as hired muscle on everything from a drone container ships to small smuggling vessels. Most of those small boats were in the Egan, though. Quick runs between small islands. Shit, I remember this one time. Chastity suddenly starts snickering to herself. The snicker becomes a chuckle, and the chuckle eventually turns into a roaring laugh as she doubles over, clutching her sides. Don't mind me, I'll just stand here awkwardly. Chastity begins coughing in enough effort to catch her breath. Sorry, I just... She gestures excitedly towards the grill with one hand. The fish! Finally pulling herself together, the mercenary stands up and takes a long, deep breath, wiping a tear from her eye. She launches into a story. Okay, so this one time I was out in a fishing boat, but the skipper was actually running guns and missiles to Bari, right? Not much danger out there aside from the other gun runners and pirates. So when we were take so we were taking a slow, a nice warm summer cruise. I'd been amusing myself by fishing while I kept watch. I got a tug on my line and I reeled in this amazing gl uh, gilt head sea bream. It was beautiful, a good ten kilos. She stares off into the distance, shaking her head in disbelief. I knew right then that it that it's what we were having for dinner that night. That's a hell of a big fish. One of the other mercs on the boat thought uh, was this elf pistol adept, fastidious guy. Liked his fine wine and food. Anyway, he sidles up, asks what I'm gonna do with it. What do you think I'm gonna do, I said. I'm gonna grill up some olive oil, lemons, and garlic. You know, standard Greek-style stuff. 
Well, the elf gets a, a look at... Gets a look uh, like I slapped his mother. He just screws his face up in a sneer and asks what the hell is wrong with me. I asked him how he'd do it. You have to poach a fish like that. Lay down a bed of pilaf rice, zucchini, uh, bell peppers, and onions. You cook it slow on, in foil, in a touch of wine. Only a barbarian would grill it, he says to me. Chastity dips her head, grinning. That wasn't something I was prepared to hear. I explained to him that to preserve the fish's natural flavor, grilling was the superior choice. I might have suggested that he had delusions of aristocracy. He countered that with method he counted that his method would create a superior flavor profile overall, as well as a complete meal, and questioned if my mother had been a goat and my father a chimpanzee. That went on until he had his Colt Manhunter's barrel halfway into my mouth and my combat knife was pressed against his trachea. We would have kept at our argument, too, if the first mate hadn't doused us with a fire hose. That seems like a dangerous thing to do to break up a fight when someone supposedly has their ni a knife at someone's throat. Uh, Chastity grins at you expectantly. Who do you think would have won? The rest of the crew, obviously. We'd both be dead, and then they'd have gone to eat the fish however they wanted. Anyway, we got blasted with the fire hose, and the fish got blasted through a scupper and back out to sea. So the whole argument wound up having... Wound up, wound up sort of fizzling out. I think we ended up having spam and eggs instead. That seems redundant. Spam and rice, sure, but spam and eggs seems kind of redundant because they're both protein. Anyway, what do you know about the Joholoa? Quite a bit. They're pirates. They live around Hong Kong, and Jomo's the only slightly crazier than most of them. What else is there to know? Sorry. Sorry, I assumed you were interested in something in particular. How do they operate? Or where do they operate? They'll go anywhere in the South China Sea. I've heard stories they get as far north as Hangzhou sometimes, but ma and make runs to Darwin if the car goes right. But in terms of their home base, it's been Sai Kung for over 10 years. They're 100% Hong Kong natives, even if some of the locals don't th seem to think so. Chastity grins crookedly. I guess that's part of why I like them so much. They're kind of mixed up, multinational family that makes the modern world so interesting. Their only nation is their fleet and their language a mixed up, mix up of Indonesian, Cantonese, Tangalong, Malay, Spal Spanish, and English. They're beholden to no one but themselves. That's an admirable thing in this time and age. So what's a pirate's life like? Chastity frowns, glancing at you with a sidelong fashion. Why are you asking me and not Jomo? You know him better than you know me, I'm the, and, and I only know what I see from the outside. I mean... I guess that I know more about them than most people, she sighs and shrugs. Okay, well, I guess the first thing to know is that it isn't glamorous as they make it out to be. Most of the Joho Loa ships are living hand to mouth. They don't have any savings, and they can wind up stranded if something breaks down at sea. It's mostly a lot of sailing around, bribing harbor masters and find to find out what ships are carrying the good stuff, then running off to steal it all. Some pirates show up with big guns, this family would rather do it with a fast hit and run. Sure, they've got big guns, but they'll only use them as last resort. Ammo costs money, you know. How'd they get started? They were Filipino refugees, mostly. Two clans, the Joho and the Loa, resisted the Japanese occupation of the Philippines. Some joined the Huk rebels, but most decided to join the Hakka fishing, the Hakka fishing communities around Hong Kong. Over the years, they intermarried. At first with each other, then with the Chinese, Indonesians, and Malaysians as well. The whole venture is pretty much a family affair. Each ship tends to run along family lines. The captain is a family elder, backed up with their spouse as a first mate. The eldest child, sometimes a, uh, sometimes sibling, is the bosun. The kids are the deck hens. It seems to work out well. It's basically just a family business, and the fleets of ships are extended family. Chastity gestures towards the expanse of the Bentang, smiling crookedly. Because of that, they're united but independent. Take the Bentang, for example. It isn't Utama's ship, it's her family, her house, her business, and her legacy to pass on to her children. That's part of why they don't stand up, they don't like stand up fights as much as they like hit and run jobs. Nobody wants to get their family killed. See you. A lot of colorful people to meet around here. We haven't even actually gone back to meet with the crew yet. This, this place is just covered in people. 
If there's anything that the Shadowrun people like to do, it's make up a whole bunch of characters like they're filling out D&D uh, sheets. So that every time we get to a new location, then we're going to be meeting a lot of new people. That's uh, a friendly orc. And uh, oh, there's Officer Huey. Huey. Some people get around. Anyway, guys, I'll see you next time.